In the swamps of the Everglades a 16-foot-long Burmese python is searching for prey. Soon it will find its prey, attack it, and eat it. But at the same time inside the python, another hunt is going on, another predator is moving with it through the undergrowth, and no matter what the python does, that predator will win, and once it has won, it will crawl out of its body. It is the species tongueworm. A pale, bean-shaped parasite up to three inches long, it lives in the python's lungs and feeds on its blood. It lays eggs inside the python which then develop, causing severe damage to the host. Sometimes it moves on its own. In rare cases the parasite emerges from the python's mouth, pushing itself out of the lungs even after the host has died. Now let's look at how it works, because its life cycle is essentially a series of tasks. Eggs are coughed up or expelled in python feces. An insect eats the eggs. A frog eats the insects. A snake eats the frog. The tongue worm eventually reaches its destination and burrows into the new host's respiratory system, where it quietly grows and develops. Scientists say a snake's lungs can harbor dozens, even hundreds of these parasites. In one documented case, 107 adult tongue worms were found in the respiratory system of an eastern racer snake during an autopsy. The consequences for these snakes are clear. If a giant worm takes up residence in the lungs, breathing becomes more difficult, energy is depleted, and the snake eventually dies. But the problem isn't the parasite itself, it's that it's invasive, like its original host. Burmese pythons aren't native to Florida, they were introduced in the 1990s, likely by pet owners who couldn't care for them anymore. Those pythons brought tongue worms with them from Asia, and now the exotic parasite has spread to at least 19 native snake species. Water snakes, rat snakes, and even pygmy rattlesnakes are now infected. And unlike pythons which have evolved to resist the parasite, native snakes have no defenses, their lungs are smaller, their immune systems are not yet adapted to fight off the invaders. For them even a single tongue worm can be a death sentence. In some parts of Florida, native snake populations are in serious decline. Scientists have documented significant declines in areas with the highest tongue worm prevalence. Pythons can survive with dozens of parasites in their lungs. Native snakes cannot. They develop pneumonia, have difficulty breathing and eventually stop hunting because they are too weak. And when they die the tongue worms emerge, ready to continue the cycle in the next victim. What makes this invasion so difficult to control is habitat. Florida's warm wet wetlands are a haven for parasite vectors. Insects, frogs and lizards thrive here, providing endless opportunities for the tongue worm to spread. Each infected snake that dies becomes a source of millions of eggs, polluting the ecosystem and ensuring that the next generation of parasites will find a new host. Even more worrying, the parasite and snake problem is much more serious than it seems. Scientists admit that only half of the known snake species in the US and Canada have ever been tested for parasites. What's happening to the rest? No one really knows. However, there are signs of optimism. Some native species show remarkable resilience. For example, Florida water snakes can survive even with heavy parasite infections, suggesting that over time, through natural selection, some snake populations can develop resistance to drugs. Did you like this video? Don't forget to hit the bell, share it with your friends and subscribe if you haven't already. If you thought tongue worms were disturbing, wait until you hear about what happened to a Persian horned viper in 2010. Scientists examining the snake noticed a festering wound on its body. When they investigated closer they discovered the wound was moving. Inside were dozens of fly larvae, pale and writhing, feeding on the snake's living flesh. Ten of them were still alive. Nearby four pupae were ready to hatch. The researchers kept watching, and within three days adult flies emerged. The snake had become an incubator, a living nursery for the next generation of flies. This condition is called meiasis, and it's more common than most people realize. It occurs when flies lay their eggs in open wounds or the body cavities of living or recently dead animals. The larvae hatch and begin feeding on tissue, burrowing deeper as they grow. For the Persian horned viper, the infestation was nearly fatal. The snake was already weak and sluggish, unable to defend itself. The moisture from the wound attracted a female fly, which saw an opportunity and deposited her eggs. From that moment the snake's fate was sealed. The larvae ate their way through decaying and living tissue alike, consuming the snake from the inside out. Without human intervention, that viper would have died, and the flies would have completed their life cycle inside the corpse. This raises a disturbing question. How many snakes in the wild suffer the same fate but are never found? 
how many die slowly, consumed by larvae, in places where no scientist will ever document their death? The answer is probably thousands. Myasis in reptiles is rarely studied because it's rarely observed. By the time someone finds an infected snake, it's usually already dead, and the flies have moved on. But the story doesn't end with flies. Once a snake dies, the body becomes a resource, and nature wastes nothing. Ants are often the first to arrive. They swarm the corpse, stripping flesh from bone with remarkable efficiency. Their feeding leaves distinctive marks, jagged and wavy patterns across the skin that can be mistaken for injuries the snake sustained while alive. But these are the signatures of decay, the final chapter written by insects. Some ant species are more aggressive than others. Red imported fire ants for example are notorious corpse scavengers. They don't just feed on the dead snake. They attack any other insects trying to do the same. Fly larvae, beetles, anything that competes for the meal is torn apart. In doing so fire ants speed up decomposition and eliminate parasites that might still be inside the body. When fire ants find a snake carcass, they turn it into a battlefield, and they always win. Then there's Leptogenes coecilia, a species of wandering ant found in Central and South America. These ants don't just scavenge, they hunt. In at least one documented case, they were found feeding on a snake that may have still been alive when they attacked. Their long spiked mandibles and potent venom can paralyze small vertebrates, making them one of the few ant species capable of killing a snake. If the snake they attack is carrying parasites, those parasites become part of the meal. Nothing is wasted. The ants consume everything. This is the reality of death in nature. A snake's body doesn't simply rot away. It becomes a complex ecosystem, a temporary home for dozens of species, each playing a role in breaking it down. Flies lay eggs. Larvae feed. Ants strip the remains. Bacteria finish what the insects leave behind. And if the snake was infected with parasites, those too are consumed. Their life cycles interrupted by the very process of decay. In a strange way death becomes a form of pest control ensuring that parasites don't spread unchecked through the environment. But sometimes what emerges from a dead snake isn't a parasite or an insect. Sometimes it's another snake. In 2011 on the Greek island of Corfu, a man made a discovery that defied belief. A four-lined snake lay dead on the ground, killed by a cat. But as he watched, something began to move inside the corpse. Slowly a head pushed its way up through the dead snake's throat and emerged from its mouth. It was a smaller doll's whip snake and it was alive. Somehow this snake had been swallowed whole by the larger predator, survived inside its stomach, and when the predator died it crawled free. This is extraordinarily rare, but it's not impossible. Snakes are opportunistic feeders, and sometimes they bite off more than they can chew, literally. A snake might swallow prey that's too large, too aggressive or simply too lucky. If the predator is killed or dies shortly after feeding, the prey might still be alive inside, waiting for an opportunity to escape. In the case of the Corfu snake, the whip snake had been swallowed recently enough that it hadn't yet been digested. When the larger snake died, the smaller one simply reversed its journey, pushing its way back up and out. But there's another, more common scenario where one snake emerges from another. Regurgitation. In 2017, a man captured shocking footage of a snake vomiting another snake, and the expelled snake was still moving. Herpetologists explained that this happens when a snake overeats and then gets startled or stressed. After consuming a large meal snakes become sluggish and vulnerable. Their bodies are focused entirely on digestion, and they can't move quickly. If a threat appears, their only defense is to lighten the load. They regurgitate their meal, sometimes violently, and flee. Most of the time the regurgitated prey is dead. But occasionally if the snake ate recently and the prey was swallowed whole without much damage, it can survive. It emerges covered in mucus and stomach acid, disoriented but alive. It's a second chance at life, granted by pure luck and timing. For the predator, it's a waste of energy and a lost meal. For the prey, it's a miracle. There's even a stranger possibility. If a female snake dies while carrying fully developed eggs, those eggs can sometimes be saved. The window for survival is incredibly narrow. The eggs must already be viable, meaning the embryos inside are fully formed and ready to hatch. They must be carefully extracted from the dead mother without damage, and they must be incubated under the right conditions. When everything aligns perfectly, hatchlings can emerge from a mother who is no longer alive. It's life outlasting death by the thinnest of margins. These cases remind us that a snake's body is never just a body. It's a container. 
a vessel that might hold parasites, prey, or even offspring, and when that vessel breaks open, whether through decay, predation, or human intervention, what comes out can surprise us. Sometimes it's horrifying, sometimes it's tragic, and sometimes against all odds, it's life itself. But not all creatures that emerge from snakes are survivors, some are killers. In 2019, wildlife rescuers in Australia responded to a call about a carpet python found in a backyard swimming pool. When they arrived they discovered something that made even experienced handlers recoil. The snake was covered with over 500 ticks, not scattered across its body but clustered so densely that its scales were barely visible. Each tick was swollen with blood engorged to several times its normal size. The rescuers said the snake's body felt like a bag of moving marbles. Every slight touch caused the ticks to shift and writhe beneath the skin. The python was dying. It had become so weak from blood loss that it had apparently tried to drown itself in the pool, perhaps seeking relief from the constant drain on its system. Veterinarians who examined the snake diagnosed severe anemia. The ticks had consumed so much blood that the snake's body could no longer function properly. Its organs were shutting down. Without immediate intervention it would have been dead within days, and those 500 ticks would have dropped off to lay their eggs creating thousands more parasites to infest other reptiles. Here's what makes tick infestations particularly insidious. Ticks don't just feed and leave. Male ticks often remain attached to a host for months, waiting. They're not there primarily to feed. They're waiting for females. When a female tick attaches and begins feeding, she releases pheromones that signal her presence. Male ticks detect these chemical signals and crawl across the host's body to find her. They mate directly on the snake's skin, turning the reptile into both a feeding ground and a breeding arena. The snake becomes a living ecosystem for the tick's entire reproductive cycle. In healthy snakes, a few ticks are manageable. The immune system can handle the blood loss, and the snake continues hunting and living normally. But when a snake becomes sick, injured or weakened by other parasites, ticks sense the vulnerability. They accumulate in greater numbers, drawn by the host's inability to defend itself. The infestation grows exponentially. 10 ticks become 50, 50 become 200 and suddenly the snake is hosting a colony that's actively killing it. The process is slow and agonizing. As more blood is drained, the snake becomes lethargic, it stops hunting because it lacks the energy. Starvation compounds the anemia. The snake seeks shelter, often in cool damp places, which ironically makes it even more attractive to additional ticks. The cycle accelerates until the host dies, and when it does, the ticks don't die with it. They simply drop off digest their final meal, and search for a new host. The dead snake has served its purpose, but ticks aren't the only external parasites that can kill a snake. In some documented cases from Florida's Everglades, snakes have been found with even more horrifying injuries. Insects had fed inside their eye sockets. The snakes were still alive when discovered, but they were completely blind. The insects had consumed the soft tissue of the eyes, leaving empty cavities where the organs once were. How the snakes survived long enough to be found is a mystery. How they hunted without sight is impossible to imagine. Most likely they didn't. They were slowly starving, unable to locate prey, waiting for death in the darkness that had consumed their vision. These cases are rarely documented because they're rarely discovered. A blind snake doesn't survive long in the wild, it becomes prey itself, or it simply wastes away in hiding. By the time humans find it, if they ever do, it's usually already dead. And when researchers examine the body they find evidence of the insects that fed on it, the parasites that lived inside it, and the slow cascade of failures that led to its death. Every autopsy tells a story of suffering that happened completely out of sight. The cases I've described are documented and verified by scientists, but here's the unsettling truth. These are just the ones we know about. The vast majority of snake deaths happen in places humans never see. In swamps, forests, deserts and mountains, snakes die every day carrying parasites we've never identified, suffering from infestations we've never documented. Current research suggests fewer than half of North America's snake species have ever been tested for parasites. They've examined less than 50% of species on just one continent and already found tongueworms, nematodes, fly larvae, ticks and dozens of other parasites. What about the other 50%? What about snakes in South America, Africa, Asia and Australia? How many parasites are living inside snakes right now that science doesn't even have names for? Tracking snakes in the wild is notoriously difficult. They're secretive, often nocturnal, spending much of their time hidden beneath rocks or inside burrows. A snake can live its entire life within a few square miles and never be seen by a human. 
When it dies its body decomposes quickly consumed by insects and bacteria within days. The evidence disappears. The parasites move on. We never know what happened. This creates a massive blind spot in our understanding. Parasites don't just affect individual snakes, they affect entire populations. Fewer snakes mean more rodents, because snakes are primary rodent predators. More rodents mean more crop damage, more disease spread to humans, and disruption of the entire food web. A parasite killing snakes in a remote forest can have ripple effects that eventually reach human communities. The tongue worm invasion in Florida is a perfect example. Pythons were introduced in the 90s, but the parasite wasn't identified as a major threat until the 2000s. By then it had already spread to native species. Researchers are racing to understand the full extent of damage, but they can only test snakes they can catch, a tiny fraction of the total population. Some scientists believe we're witnessing a slow-motion extinction event, not a dramatic die-off that makes headlines, but a gradual decline driven by parasites most people have never heard of. The snakes disappear quietly, one by one. By the time we notice the absence, it might be too late. Reesing when. If you found this video as fascinating and unsettling as I did, don't forget to hit the like button, share, and subscribe to the channel for more deep dives into nature's strangest mysteries. Thanks for watching, see you in the next one. Thanks for being with us on this great journey. Leave your thoughts in the comments and like to help us. Remember to subscribe for more. See you soon.